Τότε. Ωραία. Α, Κωνσταντίνε, μπορείς να βάλεις το, την εισαγωγική διαφάνεια όσο θα ξεκινάω εγώ να κάνω την εισαγωγή. Mm -hmm. Οπότε, για να μπορείς πολύ ωραία, πάρα πολύ ωραία. Ωραία. Πολύ ωραία. Ε, uh, welcome everybody in the today's talk. Uh, we are glad to have with us Kostadinos Gurguliados from the University of Patras. Uh, people here in the audience know him. He has uh, somehow collaborations with our institute. He has given a talk in the past and we are glad to have him with us again today, speaking about magnetic field evolution in neutron star crusts, all effects and beyond. Uh, so, Kostadinos, you may yeah. start uh, your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to be uh, with you, even though it's uh, virtual. Um, so today I'm going to discuss uh, some results that we have been doing on the magnetic field evolution in neutron stars. Um, I will discuss the whole effect, but I would like also to go beyond the whole effect. Um, I have, as uh, Panos mentioned, I have also visited um, back in 2017 and 18 uh, the research center, and I was checking my talk back then um, that, to make sure that uh, I will not uh, be repeating myself, so I will try to focus on the results that we have uh, after 2017, but I'll also give some uh, connection with this. So here I'm mentioning the people that we have collaborated um, in more than one papers, because if I include all the people that have been involved in just one paper, then the list will be very big. So we started with this exploration with Andrew Cumming from McGill, then with Rainer Hollerbach from Leeds and Toby Hood from Newcastle. Uh, then Andre Gosev joined the uh, Leeds group. He is a postdoc there. David de Grandis is doing and he's submitted his PhD in Padova. And also I want to mention the contribution of three uh, excellent uh, undergrad students uh, here from Patras, Savina Tsikli, Lydia Costandino, and Zoe Magnati, uh, who have worked um, on these projects and I will, for their uh, undergraduate thesis, so I will be showing some results from uh, their work that I believe have the potential of uh, being further explored. So uh, just to go on a brief outline of my talk, uh, I have two bits, I have the physics and the application. Uh, so the physics um, will focus on the whole effect, anomic dissipation, thermal evolution, plastic flow, and uh, some hint of uh, the battery. Um, and the application will go, and I will discuss uh, things relevant to magnetars, but also radio pulsar, central compact objects, and even some potential interest that this could have to uh, millisecond pulsars. So um, just to be uh, brief, uh, we have um, a big population of uh, neutron stars that have been observed in various forms, either as uh, uh, radio pulsars, uh, also as uh, magnetars, uh, millisecond pulsars down here. And uh, we have the period and the period derivative uh, diagram. Now, uh, with the assumption that, uh, uh, that their evolution and their um, spin down is caused uh, by a dipole magnetic field, we can make an estimate of the strength of the magnetic field and of the characteristic edge. That's just under this assumption. However, we have um, a large population of uh, neutron stars that uh, have a bolometric uh, luminosity, mainly in um, the thermal, in thermal X-rays, which is higher than their spin down. So while uh, the kinetic energy is um, the primary source of energy for the, large, the, the, the larger part of the population of neutron stars. We have several neutron stars that uh, this spin down power is not enough. And what would be the cause, uh, the extra source, the extra reservoir of energy could be the magnetic field energy. Most of these neutron stars have strong magnetic fields or uh, are relatively hot. So essentially, 
we can have a hint or um, um, actually I don't think it's just a hint, it's probably evidence that uh, the magnetic field evolves. Now going to magnetars, uh, these uh, neutron stars have Saturn energetic events. They have increases in fluxes, uh, changes in pulse shape, uh, spectral indices. And if we try to scale the dipolar magnetic field to the outburst energy, we see that there is a trend of uh, stronger uh, outbursts compared uh, versus uh, stronger dipolar fields. Um, now, this could be a hint that uh, the magnetic field evolves, and as it evolves, uh, it deforms the crust, and this could be uh, this could lead to had sudden heat uh, deposition, or also external magnetic field evolution. So, uh, the magnetic field of the magnetosphere has been twisted; it reaches a point where it becomes unstable, or no further twist is uh, possible, and uh, it releases the energy through reconnection. Um, now, going uh, to the magnetars um, themselves and uh, checking their spectra, uh, you can see here that um, there is a part that can be fitted by a black body, uh, radi uh, black body law, uh, where actually uh, suggests that we have thermal radiation that originates from localized spots. These are uh, sizes of about a kilometer or even less than that, which is um, hotter by almost a factor of, uh, of almost an order of magnitude from the rest of the star. The non-thermal part is possibly related to the magnetosphere. Um, and again, we have the, uh, uh, the scaling of the magnetic field with the X-ray power. Now, if we, if we look at this uh, plot carefully, uh, we the, the, the data is uh, a bit scattered, that's the quiescent emission. But what we actually see here is that uh, we can't really fit them with a B square relation. So essentially, this looks uh, steeper. So the X ray power looks steeper than the magnetic field power, than the magnetic field uh, uh, squared. So this implies that uh, if we assume that there is a magnetic field that decays ohmically because the crust has some finite resistivity. This would not be enough because this should uh, be scaling with uh, B square. So um, we need some mechanism that accelerates uh, uh, this decay and converts the magnetic energy to thermal energy. Now, um, so this is some further evidence, I think, for magnetic field evolution. Now, um, Another, another uh, interesting result um, was um, the result that uh, was um, found in uh, uh, Savinas and uh, Lydia's undergrad thesis. What actually they did is that they got the sample, uh, they got actually the catalog of supernova remnants that has been um, developed by Safi Harb. Um, and uh, this has about uh, 350 supernova remnants, about 60, um, of these uh, supernova remnants host uh, a neutron star. So what they did is that they analyzed the ages um, of the supernova remnants, essentially the expansion ages, and they compared against the characteristic ages of the pulsars that were living in, uh, um, in the supernova remnants. You see actually that there is a very good correlation. So this line here is uh, the line where the supernova remnant age and the characteristic aids are equal, but there are some um, deviations. Now, these deviations, if for instance, you do this exercise in the crab, you will get um, uh, if um, the characteristic uh, age is higher than the supernova remnant age, you can get a hint of the initial period. However, what you see here is that we have a lot of systems, almost half of them, where the supernova remnant age is higher than the characteristic age. So in this case, this number would have been negative, and obviously we couldn't take the square root of that. So actually this suggests that uh, we can't uh, attribute all this difference to some initial period, but maybe this could be related to some uh, magnetic field evolution. So if the magnetic field evolves, then obviously we can't use this formula because this assumes that the magnetic field is constant. Uh, but then if it's growing or decreasing, we can um, um, uh, reconcile this uh, 
reconcile the characteristic ages with the supernova remnant ages. So actually they did this exercise and they found that uh, for um, the members of this uh, sample, for this about 50 to, for this uh, 60 actually, uh, neutron stars that can be found in supernova remnants, they are mostly young ones. Uh, you, can, um, uh, you can put these numbers into agreement if you assume that either the magnetic field has decreased, that's the fractional decreased throughout the life of the neutron star or increased by a factor of uh, approximately 40 to 50 percent. Um, so that's an interesting result and I think that uh, it's an indication um, that uh, possibly the magnetic field evolves, but also I think it can tell us more things about the statistics. So now uh, I will go back to the physics on uh, how we can model the magnetic field evolution in the crust. So the seminal work of Goldreich and Ray Zinegger has suggested that uh, the crust uh, um, is in some uh, mechanical equilibrium and um, we can write the induction equation on the, in this form. So typically, uh, if, you, if you go to the induction equation, you here you have the plasma velocity, but because the crust is an ion lattice where the ions are fixed, but the electrons are free to move, you can equate the electron, the fluid velocity to the electron velocity. So it's like a one fluid, uh, a single fluid MHD. This term over here is the ohmic um, term, the electron number density and the thermal conductivity. Now putting this, uh, num this um, the, the typical numbers for these parameters, we can get the whole time scale, which is in the order of a few uh, thousand to a few tens of thousand. You see that there is uh, some variation here because we have the electron number density that changes uh, a lot throughout the crust. And the ohmic time scale is in the scale of millions to tens of millions of years. Again, this depends um, on sigma that changes by a couple of orders of magnitude um, throughout uh, the crust. So um, one uh, the task that we had was to integrate uh, this equation. Of course, there have been other groups that uh, have explored this problem. And I will briefly mention the axisymmetric results. Um, so what we did is that we simulated an axisymmetric spherical shell. Uh, and what we found in these uh, simulations, you can see here the toroidal and the poloidal field that developed, and here the electron fluid velocity. And over here, you see on the horizontal axis psi, which is uh, the magnetic flux function. It's essentially, if you think of it as a number, uh, as an index for the field lines. And on the vertical axis is omega, the electron fluid angular velocity. So if you, if you see what happens here, is that for a given, for instance, uh, for a given field line, uh, you have a lot of differential rotation. So the electrons move with different velocities. You can see here, you have darker blue to lighter blue as you go from the surface to the, uh, to the base. Uh, but then as the system evolves, it goes to some sort of isorotation. This, is, um, this reminds actually, um, and I think that's relevant to the people that are doing solar physics research, uh, Ferraro's isorotation law. So what we get here is that the magnetic field organizes itself to uh, some sort of equilibrium that is reached uh, for these particular systems within um, a few uh, tens of kilo years. Now, how can this be relevant um, and important for neutron stars? We, uh, even from this axisymmetric result, we, get the we, we reach the conclusion that uh, the evolution of the neutron star will be more prominent when it is young and out of equilibrium. And then after some time, uh, the magnetic field will relax to some uh, equilibrium and will not give the, so many bursting events. So this is also something that has been uh, mentioned and found by uh, Pons and Perna in 2011. And here we also find uh, the exact shape of saturation. So uh, I will move now to the three-dimensional uh, calculations that we have done. And uh, here we had uh, used um, uh, a version uh, or actually a new code that is based on uh, parody code, a drastically modified, uh, a modified version of the parody code um, in collaboration with Toby Wood and Hollerbach. 
uh, Rainer Follerbach, and we run um, uh, about um, 180 simulations with combinations of colloidal and toroidal uh, field. So what we found actually in these uh, simulations, here is the radial field, the theta field, and the phi field, and this is what the magnetic field of the neutron star looks like. So essentially, these initial conditions would correspond to a magnetic field that has been sheared internally because of some possible differential rotation while the uh, neutron star was, um, the crust was freezing. What we actually found here is that um, while um, in uh, the, the, the magnetic field does not remain axisymmetric, it starts developing these uh, wavy patterns that are very prominent in the meridional field in R and the radial, the R and theta, whereas the phi field becomes um, uh, very um, disordered, as you can see here. So there are some positive and negative uh, regions in this area. And if we are to plot the magnetic field lines like we do here, you actually see that there are some regions where the magnetic field is very strong. In color, we show the magnetic field energy density scaled to the maximum value or B squared over B max squared. And above these regions here, you actually notice that there are some, uh, uh, some loops of uh, external field. Now, if we compare the dipole component, because also this configuration contains some dipole component, for the simulations that have been unstable and uh, become highly non axisymmetric we see that the dipole component drops here. We started with a strength of about four times 10 to the 14 Gauss, but then the localized magnetic field on the surface becomes about uh, two times 10 to the 15 Gauss. Now, this is um, an interesting result because uh, in uh, several uh, magnetars, we expect to have regions that are much, that have much stronger uh, magnetic field than the dipole component. Um, and this would be the sources of, um, um, of um, unstable behavior and bursts. Moreover, when we uh, compare um, on the right hand side, the loss, the decrease of the magnetic, um, of the magnetic energy, and we compare that against the X-ray quiescent power, we found actually that uh, with magnetic fields of uh, dipolar magnetic fields of four times 10 to the 14 Gauss, we can uh, uh, explain with uh, the, 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 the entire population of uh, strongly magnetized neutron stars. Obviously we have these ones that are over here, but these ones can be explained with a weaker um, dipolar field. The, the hard part was to understand this without postulating an uh, incredibly strong magnetic field. Now, um, these are actually the, uh, the, the, the only question here is that, um, or actually one of the questions here is that uh, the magnetic field that we have assumed uh, does not, uh, the, the model actually that we have used does not include any thermal evolution. So um, our calculation of the power is somewhat uh, simplified in a sense that uh, we calculate how much magnetic field gets dissipated and we assume that this energy is uh, radiated. Um, now, continuing in this um, type of simulations, we were motivated by another question. So um, in some models of um, uh, pulsar uh, emission, uh, that are using curvature radiation. They require multipolar fields for the, uh, for the generation of the initial particle population uh, and the cascade. So essentially, if the magnetic field is not strong enough and the magnetic field is not very curved, as would be in a model that has only a dipole, this may not be so efficient. So what we wanted to understand now was whether we could, with this kind of models, to have a, a dipole that is in the range of the normal pulsar population, so about 10 to the 12 um, Gauss, for instance, but also this has uh, multiple poles. So what we did here is that we calculated models where the dipole strength, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers here, uh, this is about uh, six times 10 to the 12 Gauss, but the toroidal field that, uh, uh, 
we have is uh, much stronger. So when we run these um, simulations, we found actually the various, the following interesting things. First of all, uh, the toroidal field undergoes some type of instability and it starts generating these uh, zones here of positive and negative uh, radial field, um, which uh, is an indication of instability that I will discuss in a little bit. Uh, and also this tends to move towards the Northern Hemisphere. The fact that it moves towards the Northern Hemisphere is something that we understand quite well. And it's related to the fact that we are using a single fluid approximation where we have only electrons. So this will give some uh, north-south asymmetry. And for a particular orientation of the toroidal field, it will try to move to one hemisphere. If we have used um, an opposite orientation for the toroidal field, the motion of these uh, zones would be towards the southern hemisphere. Uh, the interesting bit though in these calculations is that uh, first of all, the magnetic field tends to concentrate in one uh, hemisphere, but also because the dipole component is not uh, so strong, the toroidal component because of these instabilities uh, moves the uh, axis of the dipole component. So for these particular models, within um, a few uh, tens to hundreds of kilo years, we see that uh, the relative angle with respect to its initial position of the, of the dipole changes drastically and it can move in drift along uh, uh, 20 or more degrees. If we try to, uh, if we draw uh, for the evolution of the magnetic field that we have, the PP dot diagram, you see that the neutron stars we have assumed start with uh, relatively moderate, well, with non-magnetar magnetic fields. These are in the range of a few times to 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 or a few times 10 to the 13 Gauss, then move for the first uh, period of their life in lines that are parallel to uh, the constant magnetic field lines, the dotted lines. Uh, but then as the magnetic field decays and also when it starts oscillating, they tend to go down. And um, these are the, uh, the uh, if you can see here, a triangle and a circle. These are for ages of, for real neutron star ages of a uh, hundred uh, kilo years and um, uh, essentially giga year. So actually you see that, uh, sorry, a mega year, not uh, giga year. So actually what you see here is the, the evolution. So this start um, in this region, but then they move into the region of the population of uh, radio pulsars. Now, um, when we tried something slightly different, we uh, misaligned the axis of symmetry of the toroidal field with the dipole axis. What we noticed is that the dipole axis was started wobbling after the first few uh, hundred years, and it moved quite far. So that's the angle of the dipole axis with respect to its initial position. And also we have the formation of uh, magnetic spots in the regions, these regions over here, which corresponds to uh, approximately the rotation of the toroidal field uh, axis of symmetry. Now, uh, in this case, we have the creation of a single magnetic spot, the drift of the dipole axis, we have the formation of multiples as we wanted initially. And also there is um, an interesting result um, in um, CRAB where they found that uh, the angle between the rotation axis and the magnetic uh, uh, field tend to change. Um, and we found that uh, uh, this uh, sort of similar effect. Now, uh, there have been some studies that uh, attribute uh, these changes to um, the magnetic field torques, but in general, this should try uh, to align uh, the two axes. But in, 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 in the particular case in uh, CRAB, they don't um, see this case. So uh, this, um, this effect will provide mostly um, a random motion because it depends on the toroidal field and the instability and not um, uh, an order motion trying to align the two axes. Now, uh, in, the, in the plots that I have shown before, uh, you actually notice the formation of these uh, zones. 
And these were, um, uh, these were evident when we had uh, a strong toroidal field and um, there could be some related to some type of instability. So um, we knew uh, two types of fall instabilities that we have studied uh, numerically and um, analytically. One, an ideal um, uh, instability, which is related to the fact that uh, the electron number, number density is stratified. So um, one can show mathematically without much trouble, but uh, to understand the physics of this instability, I don't think it's so clear uh, that it leads to some, um, uh, to some unstable behavior. And then there is um, a resistive type of instability uh, that operates even at uniform density. And um, this type of instability is, most, is, um, is a resistive one. It depends on the, um, on the, uh, on the magnetic field resistivity it depends also on the thickness of the crust uh, but uh, it works at uh, uniform density so it's some kind some type of steric instability so we explored with this problem with uh, Jose Pons and uh, we found that um, uh, the crust um, um, we, we because we wanted to disentangle between these two instabilities uh, we used the um, um, a, a crust that has um, a uniform density, so that's essentially a toy crust. Uh, so in this case, we wouldn't expect to see the first instability, and we would see only the second instability if this was the case. So by doing the analysis and initially trying a crust with realistic thickness of 0.1 R neutron star, we saw this picture, so that was clearly uh, the resistive type of instability. And also we have found by doing analytical calculations that the number, um, the, the wave number, if you want, of this instability depends on the thickness of the crust. So this is a slice of the crust um, if you cut it uh, uh, parallel to the equator, and this is the picture of the star. So actually what we saw here is that there was a clear dependence on the, um, on the thickness on the, on the wave num of the wave number um, to the thickness of the crust. And we also did um, uh, the linear analysis of this um, instability, the growth rate. And we found that if we analyze these modes to uh, spherical harmonics, LMs, that they tend to have a maximum at around 15 or 20. And if you count uh, the number of maxima here, they scale quite well with this um, uh, calculation. So, um, I will move now to some uh, other results that uh, are also including the magnetothermal evolution. So uh, in, this, um, in this case now, what you actually see is that the top equation is the usual fall equation that I have been discussing before, but also the lower equation is related to the magnetothermal evolution. Uh, so, um, what this is telling us is that the magnetic field will change uh, part of the energy. Uh, the energy will be uh, advected by the gradient of um, temperature. So that's the uh, usual um, the usual term in the diffusion equation. But also there will be energy source terms over here, which is which will be related to the electric current uh, squared, and also there will be terms here, which is the advection of entropy parallel to the electric uh, current. So this project was uh, led by Andrei Gosev uh, from, um, from Leeds. And uh, what Andrei uh, did for this project was to run the same models that we had before, uh, but uh, now he included uh, these uh, terms as well. So. Uh, by including these terms, now we have a consistent model that is telling us, that is giving us the thermal map uh, on the surface of uh, a neutron star. Um, so for instance, the misaligned poloidal to toroidal field where most of the energy is in the toroidal field and the strength is 10 to the 14 Gauss, uh, give us this thermal map. If you, if you rotate the neutron star, you see here that uh, even in the temperature, there are some artifacts of this instability. These are the linear structures. And you see some regions that are not exactly in the form of 
spots as you would um, as one would visualize a spot, but some extended hotter regions. So by fitting the um, a small number of parameters, uh, the phase, the inclination between the rotation axis and the dipolar field and the line of sight. Um, and using just uh, two of the models that were the poloidal, um, where the poloidal and the toroidal, containing poloidal and toroidal field, and 90% of the energy is in the toroidal field, he has managed to, uh, we have managed to, mo to model uh, successfully a large number of uh, magnetars. So um, in this, um, in this case, I think that uh, the results are not uh, simply uh, academic, but uh, they give us um, uh, a good understanding that uh, essentially with a small number of models and parameters, essentially putting 90% of the energy in the toroidal field, uh, we can get the light curves of magnetars. Um, we have explored now um, another class of objects, the central compact objects, which are X-ray sources that are found uh, at the centers of young supernova remnants. So um, they don't have um, any counterparts in uh, other wavelengths or pulsar wing, uh, wind nebulae. Uh, these are essentially the sources. And for just uh, three of them, it has been possible to have a timing solution that provides the period and the period derivative and estimate the magnetic field. Now, what's interesting here is that um, the magnetic field uh, is relatively weak. Here is um, 2.9 10 to the uh, times 10 to the 10, about 10 to the 11, and here 3 times 10 to the 10. But the X-ray bolometric uh, luminosity is above 10 to the 32 ergs. So this puts them closer to the um, magnetar rotor population. Um, there have been studies to um, discuss this problem, like uh, inefficient dynamo, because they are not so rapid rotators, so they didn't generate a, a, a dipole field, or buried and hidden field um, that, um, because of the accretion of material, um, the magnetic field is buried, um, or the existence of multipoles along with the uh, buried field. So what we tried to do is that, uh, we followed some idea that was proposed by Thompson and Murray in uh, some more or less uh, order of magnitude uh, calculation. And uh, what, what this idea suggests is that uh, uh, in, um, during the, the collapse uh, following the supernova, one can have a convective dynamo that does not depend on rotation. And this will generate the small convective cells whose radius, whose size will be comparable to 0.3% uh, of the neutron star radius. This is related to the pressure uh, scale height. Now, each one of them will contain some magnetic moment uh, that we have over here. And they have found that this dynamo should saturate at about 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 uh, Gauss. So if you place about 10 of 1,000 um, such convective cells. In the crust of a neutron star, each of them has a, a dipole field of 10 to the 14 Gauss. Then what one is going to get uh, for, the total, um, um, for the total magnetic field strength is something that scales with um, the number of the cells. And this will be in the order of 10 to the 11 Gauss. So we made this assumption taking this uh, scale, we assume that we have a buried slash turbulent magnetic field. We populated pseudo-random multiples between 10 to the, uh, with L between 10 and 20. And we buried it um, uh, up to uh, 100 meters from the surface of the neutron stars and the neutron star. And we also included a small dipolar field, keeping all the other parameters the same. So, we uh, simulated several models, either with uh, a dipole field whose um, strength varies, and uh, we also scale the uh, magnetic field energy at the interior by changing the energy of um, uh, each of these um, 
cells. And uh, we used again this code. So uh, this is a slice at about 200 meters below the surface of the, uh, of the pulsar. And you actually see that uh, what this does is that it starts populating smaller and larger regions. Moreover, uh, what we have here, this is the model that starts with uh, a magnetic field who has, uh, that, ha that has a very weak dipole. So within um, a few tens up to 100 years, the magnetic field from the interior um, moves near the surface. And then uh, essentially it makes, the, it, uh, it makes these uh, loops. Now, why do we think this is um, relevant actually to CCOs is because from CCOs we get thermal emission. So from the decay of the currents um, and through the ohmic effect, we are going to see um, thermal emission. But in addition, we also see several uh, absorption features. And these are, um, these can be attributed to particles that are trapped on these arcades above the hotter regions and uh, provide the, um, um, the, um, the absorption lines. Uh, now, we have made an exploration of the models and we found that uh, the majority of the population of central compact objects can be explained with uh, either the relatively weak magnetic field, these are the ones that have 10 to the 40, 10 to the 45 to 10 to the 46 um, ergs of energy in the magnetic field in the crust, and we not, don't need to move to very strong magnetic fields. This is also important because if we had very strong magnetic field, this would be lead to crust failure. And these neutron stars will start, uh, these central compact objects will start, um, compact objects will start providing uh, bursts and behave more like magnetar if they were uh, explained with this sort of behavior. So essentially this is a, a good indication. Also the magnetic field fluctuates a lot, mainly because of the turbulent uh, initial conditions that we have put here. Um, and, um, but it stays within uh, the range of 10 to the 12, uh, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 Gauss. And this also has um, a relay, um, an imprint on the, um, on the evolution of, on the PP dot diagram. Essentially, uh, the magnetic field is too weak to spin them down, but quite strong to move them up and down on the PP dot diagram. Um, we then repeated this work doing magnetothermal simulation of, of CCO. So again, we picked these uh, initial conditions and we ran the magnetothermal simulations for the three main families of models. You can see here the uh, uh, dust line, uh, blue, the, um, blue solid and uh, red uh, dotted. And, um, and uh, the picture that we obtained here, you see that we have multiple regions of uh, strong magnetic field, you can, see them over here, they are spread around. We don't have a few localized spots or one localized spot as we had in the other models. So because of that, essentially the pulsed fraction is very weak. So here you see it's uh, in the order of uh, up to 5%, uh, depending on the orientation angle and uh, on the type of model that we have. So, um, so far we have discussed the Hall effect, the ohmic decay, and the thermal evolution. And I will go now to some extra part that is related to the magnetic strength. So one of the assumptions that we have been using so far is that uh, the crust is very strong and uh, it can absorb any type of stress that we are giving it. Essentially, the crust evolves only because of this Hall induction equation without anything happening. Now, we know that uh, obviously this can be, uh, from the theoretical perspective, uh, an exact result, uh, a correct result, mainly because the crust has some limited um, elasticity. And essentially, if it's it deformed beyond the elastic limit, it will fail. Uh, moreover, uh, we also know from observations that neutron stars give bursts and outbursts. So this means that their crust. 
uh, fails. So uh, if we are to relax this assumption and the Maxwell stresses are very strong and they can make the crust fail, instead of just uh, using the electric, uh, um, equating the electron velocity uh, to the velocity that we would get from the carriers of the electric current, we need to solve for the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, the good thing is that um, solving for the Navier-Stokes equation, some terms are easy to get rid of because the velocities are very low. So we will end up with a much simpler relation, but we also need some criterion in order to see when the crust is going to fail. So we can write down the, uh, the Maxwell stress uh, tensor for the magnetic field, which is B I B J minus one third B square delta I J. Here, actually, we are removing the diagonal part of the stress tensor, and we are doing this because this corresponds to compression terms, uh, whereas uh, we expect the crust to fail first if we have uh, just uh, some shearing stresses. So this will make the crust much harder to uh, break. So essentially we have some type of modified von Mises criterion for failure. Now, if we take the order of magnitude calculation and uh, we see at what depth and at what strength of the magnetic field, this is going to, its term is going to dominate. We notice for instance, that for uh, near, near the surface of the star, and actually here by surface of the star, I mean the neutron drip point. Uh, here is the base of the crust and here is uh, the density, which is um, 0 0.004 of the density uh, at the interface between the crust and the core. Uh, for this region, the crust will, be a, will fail. Essentially this criterion will hold even if the magnetic field is uh, in the order of about 10 to the 14 Gauss. If we go deeper in, uh, the crust is not going to fail until uh, the magnetic field exceeds 10 to the 15 Gauss. Um, there is this big region here where we have the Hall effect. And now for weaker magnetic fields, because uh, in this region, the uh, time scale of the Hall effect will be much longer, we will be dominated practically by ohmic evolution. So actually you can see here that there is a large part of the parameter space where we have plastic evolution. So now let's discuss a bit how we are going to model that. Um, we are going to approximate and we actually have approximated this by a highly viscous flow. So essentially we uh, drop the acceleration and the convective terms and we assume that the system reaches some equilibrium where the Laplacian of the velocity is equal to the divergence of the uh, Maxwell stresses. So essentially the system is driven by this flow and this now modifies the induction equation. So this was the previous version that we had for the velocity, but here we have an extra term that is telling us that the field will get affected also by the plastic flow velocity. Now, you can see that these terms are kind of opposing each other. So one would think that uh, if we put a lot of plastic flow, this is going to stop the whole evolution. And um, we have explored this problem in Cartesian geometry first. And we actually found that if we run these simulations with different values for the plastic viscosity, uh, we see that these are very different from the simulations, the results of the simulations that we get where we have whole only evolution. So this is a Cartesian plane parallel box uh, simulation where actually we're uh, simulating only a slab of the crust. But actually what you see here is that um, if for instance, we have a very low plastic flow, uh, plastic viscosity, the evolution will be much slower. And moreover, the field that is perpendicular to the crust will be much weaker. So here is uh, about 10 to the 14. Whereas if we didn't have any plastic flow, it would be uh, about five times 10 to the 14 Gauss. And this means essentially that uh, the plastic flow velocity in general opposes um, the flow, uh, the, the whole effect. However, um, we tried to repeat this uh, problem 
when we have a, a full a full uh, crust. Now, if you have a full crust and you calculate the spell, uh, the spherical shell, that's again, that's done in axis symmetry. We are not in 3D um, yet. Um, we have to answer the question how the crust exactly fell. So for instance, we have the von Mises criterion, but we don't quite know in which region um, how, how it affects the crust. So for instance, if the crust fails in one location, does it mean that a plastic flow initiates everywhere? And whether it's local, intermediate, or global, we have tried to uh, use the extreme cases and apply uh, the plastic flow only in the regions where the criterion is satisfied. And global is the other extreme where actually, uh, if the crust fails in one uh, location, then we are going to uh, calculate and include the plastic flow velocity. Uh, the problem with that is that um, the evaluation of the plastic flow velocity is the main bottleneck of the problem. So actually we have found that this can be accelerated if for, uh, because essentially this corresponds to inverting um, uh, a Poisson equation in order to find the plastic flow velocity. So actually we found that this is accelerated if we don't check at every single step the criterion, but we leave the code uh, to run and then we calculate the plastic flow velocity every 10 or 100 time steps. And we find that actually this works quite well. So actually, when we run these simulations with a global, uh, with a local and a global um, model, what we actually notice here uh, after about 10 kilo years in uh, the simulations, as you can see here, is that uh, the B5 field is very different in these two cases. Um, the electron velocity similarly is uh, quite different because you see here is uh, a little bit lower than what it was there. Now, the interesting bit is that the plastic flow velocity, when we use the local criterion, in the local criterion, only this part of the crust fails, whereas in the global criterion, we allow to have a plastic flow everywhere. In this case, you see that the plastic flow stays here, whereas in the other case, the plastic flow is spread around the entire crust. So what this is trying to do is essentially it's trying to oppose in general the whole effect because this plastic flow velocity is opposite to the electron velocity. Whereas in this case, because the plastic flow velocity operates only in this smaller region, it can oppose only this part, but this will, be with, this will remain unaffected. So essentially you see that here we have um, a negative toroidal field in the Northern hemisphere and uh, positive in the Southern hemisphere. And here we, we will have uh, the opposite um, sign. Um, now we can go into further detail. I don't think that it's um, um, interesting to go into, well, we don't have time actually to go into all these details, uh, but um, in general, one can see that uh, comparing um, the local, global, and uh, intermediate and whole only simulations that uh, the um, inclusion of a plastic flow changes the evolution, but it does not necessarily change the strength of the magnetic field that is going to appear in the crust. Only in the global runs, uh, it, it, it um, prevents um, the whole evolution. Uh, similarly, we also explored uh, cases where the field goes right uh, between the crust to the core. So essentially it's fixed in this location. And we, um, we have uh, found again, some uh, uh, clearly different behavior on the toroidal field when we have a local or a global evolution. Um, now, uh, this could have been obviously uh, an academic exercise but very recently, there were some very interesting results by George Younes that uh, who used the uh, observations from NICER. And actually he noticed and he found that there is phase shifting of the pulse peak in uh, SGR 1830 during outburst. So these are uh, three peaks. And he found that for peak number three, it tends to move to, uh, uh, to a smaller phase cycle whereas uh, peak number one and number two, this and that, they tend to move uh, to a higher value. 
Now, the values that he found is much higher than what we uh, found in the plastic flow calculation, but we have stopped our calculation at the neutron drip point, which is quite deep in the crust, whereas what he has here is essentially the motion of the surface. So actually this um, expectation of, um, um, of uh, uh, a plastic flow that uh, appears um, uh, that appears uh, during outbursts is, um, I think it's, um, it's quite supported by uh, this result. Now I will very briefly discuss uh, some results on uh, uh, MSP and the possible relation of a term that uh, we have not used yet um, in our equation. So um, we have done quite some time ago, the analysis of noise of, uh, pulsars, and we notice that timing noise for strong uh, neutron stars, um, this is the most relevant plot. Uh, this is uh, phase noise, and this is um, frequency derivative, whereas here is in the, in the frequency scales strongly with the magnetic field strength, but it seems to be relatively flat, but non-negligible even for uh, weaker neutron stars. Now, um, we, uh, we can understand the origin of this timing noise either because of hole drift, uh, crust failure, plastic flows, or uh, anything else. But we wanted also to see if there is a way to understand timing noise in this region here. Um, now, uh, in this case, we were thinking whether we could apply the effect of um, temperature gradients normal to the density gradient and this could generate a magnetic field. So if you remember when we wrote the magnetic field induction equation, we had the ohmic term, we had, say, sorry, the whole term, the ohmic term, but also we had this term over here that is related to the temperature gradient and the entropy. And essentially this term over here is telling us that if the entropy um, as seen is not, um, uh, the, the gradient of the entropy is not parallel to the gradient of the temperature, this could generate a magnetic uh, field term. Obviously, you have uh, seen that in different contexts. So in some pulsars, we see a temperature gradient and um, a change in the, and um, which is normal to the uh, magnetic, to the um, density gradient. This is what this new term is uh, here. And uh, for instance, we are aware of uh, J0030, where actually there are some hotspots where the temperature changes drastically, or the rim of the polar cap where actually the return current from the magnetosphere may hit the surface of the star. So actually as a proof of concept, we did a simulation where we have an initial uniform field. Uh, we simulated the outer 100 meters, and then we assumed, uh, we assumed that this region here is the, in the middle of the crust is hotter than the rest of the star. So calculating now um, all these terms, uh, we found that this temperature anisotropy generates a positive magnetic field normal to the surface of the screen, as you see here. Here is a positive one. And then again, this tends to twist the uh, field that is uh, staying in the vertical uh, direction. So as a proof of concept for this type of neutron stars where the magnetic field is relatively weak, this could work. So uh, this essentially puts some perturbation and gives um, uh, generates essentially a wave with a wavelength of about 20 meters um, with a period of about 10 years. So I think um, this is a, an interesting result that was uh, um, Zoe's Magnati's um, undergraduate thesis, and possibly one can further explore and uh, apply these results. So I'll move now to my conclusions. Um, I think that uh, the magnetic field um, coupled to thermal evolution um, uh, in a neutron star crust can reproduce the magnetar light curves large hotspots in uh, X-ray uh, beam uh, neutron star, 
the characteristics of CCOs and also generates multipoles, even in moderately mo magnetized neutron stars. Uh, we have explored plastic flow. This is, a this is an important effect. Um, we have some observations that support that the crust uh, may flow, and it does not completely annul uh, the whole effect. Um, now, the interesting bit is that this is a dissipative mechanism, but as of now, we have not found that this creates strong ohmic losses. Finally, uh, even discussing the Birman battery, this does not seem to operate in strongly magnetized neutron stars because uh, it's much weaker than the other terms. But if there are thermal anisotropies on the surfaces of millisecond pulsars, it can lead to changes in, uh, uh, in scales of one to 10 years. Now, uh, the temperature gradient that we have found so far needs to be sustained uh, uh, externally. Um, and uh, then the magnetic field will be, um, will be preserved. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to uh, take questions. So thank you, Kostadinos, very much. <laughs> Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, time for questions. Yeah, and maybe you come closer. Thank you, Constance. Uh, Yannis Mandopoulos here. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Yannis. Any, any, can you connect your results to what happens in the outer magnetosphere? Uh, you, you mentioned pulses in, 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 in near the end. There was a yes. pulse difference, a movement. What yes. pulses were, were these? Right. The so um, for uh, for this one, for um, for the SDR, the eighteen thirty, um, this um, uh, this is the thermally the thermal the thermal radiation from the surface. So. Um, they are explaining in this paper through uh, the creation of possibly three hot spots uh, that are moving independent of uh, each other. Um, there is uh, no clear evidence on uh, how, how this could be related to the magnetosphere. I believe that the near magnetosphere could be related and this could be seen in uh, probably higher energies. Uh, but um, the relativistic part that is further out, I think it's not so strongly affected, but um, I'm a bit cautious um, about that. My, my, my question is, is yes. uh, we have a, a picture for the magnetosphere and every pulsar has its own uh, features about pulses and yeah. uh, pulse fractions and all that. And if we assume a dipole on the surface, then the magnetosphere should be roughly, roughly the same. Yeah. But we don't have a dipole on the surface. We have all yeah. this, uh, all this rich uh, morphology yeah. that you described here, and it's not only rich; it's also evolving. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, do you think that there may be some, uh, let's say, imprint of that uh, uh, rich morphology to the pulses of, you yeah. know, at radio and uh, gamma rays so from the outer magnetosphere, or yeah. the outer magnetosphere doesn't know anything about all that? Right, that's a, that's a good uh, question. Uh, I think that, um, um, well, we, we haven't uh, worked on that yet, um, uh, having a, a multipolar magnetic field um, on the surface and trying to connect it uh, to the exterior. Uh, David de Grandis has done a little bit of that where he's trying to um, expand the field uh, out to the light cylinder essentially and see uh, what it would look like. So he gets some region, but um, some, some regions of multipoles, uh, but this extend up to one, um, one neutron star uh, radius. So uh, if these effects are, um, the, the high energy emission comes from the, uh, from the light cylinder or near the light cylinder, I don't expect uh, to uh, see much imprint. Um, I would expect though to see uh, to relate this to uh, timing noise that we see in pulsars and probably to some uh, pulse to pulse uh, variation. Okay. 
one more. Okay. One area where you might see a difference, but yes. I don't know. Just I'm just saying that to mm -hmm. probably to explore it, is mm -hmm. that there are models that assume that the the, the the pairs in the magnetosphere come from near the surface in so-called mm -hmm. polar uh, polar cup gaps. Mm -hmm. If the morphology is there is so very different as you described it today, mm -hmm. then whether we have pairs and where we have pairs to support the currents we need in the magnetosphere may be very, very different from the simple models of the pair uh, polar cup gaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are regions where the field is very strong and we can have uh, uh, B gamma effects and have pairs. Maybe somewhere else we cannot have pairs. Maybe you can have pairs only from one hemisphere, not from the other. M maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um... Yes, actually, we are thinking of, um, and you know that uh, we are thinking of connecting the crust to the magnetosphere. Uh, but while numerically it's something that one can do uh, to understand the physics of how we go from the solid crust to the plasma field magnetosphere is, um, in terms of physics, um, we 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 need to understand it uh, better. And uh, I, I'm not sure we are there yet. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. The most do you want to ask something, please? Go ahead. The most. I was muted. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Mine is a related question. I mean, we see the. Uh, I didn't follow everything. I missed the beginning mm -hmm. of the talk also, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't claim to understand what the uh, whole effect has much to do here, but. That's besides the point. Uh, I see that you have a uh, highly uh, uh, structured, many uh, high high L multiples, high M multiples in the yes. magnetosphere and so on and so forth. In the uh, near the crust, at the bottom of the mm -hmm. of the uh, near the surface. Yeah. On the other hand, the all the flares, and I presume that's related to the flares, mm -hmm. right? That we see, if I understood correctly. Yeah. Because the uh, crust is moving, I assume, and therefore that uh, forms the, uh, it's like the sun to some extent. Mm -hmm. However, the uh, flares in general are associated with slow moving uh, objects, uh, slow rotating. The fast rotating, they may have that. Uh, yes, we do see, uh, my mm -hmm. understanding is that on occasion, standard puzzles do see some flares that we see like, in magnetars rather rarely. Most of the flares occur in uh, in uh, objects with uh, long periods. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any obvious relation there? Right. Why? Okay. Yes. Uh, so um, um, yes. So if we um, if we think of um, of the strength of the magnetic field, so this um, uh, the the, the Okay, so in order to have a flare, we need to have a relatively strong magnetic field to power the flare. Um, now, if we have a strong magnetic field, this will spin down the pulsar or the magnetar more efficiently. So actually we see most magnetars to have periods uh, higher than one second. So I would say that um, it's not the low period that is uh, the, the low period that is causing uh, the slow period that is causing the flare. Uh, I think it's more that both effects are caused by the strong magnetic field, where essentially it has spun down efficiently uh, the pulsar down to uh, uh, down to one sec, uh, a period of one second. It has nothing to do with the area over which the, there is a magnetosphere. After all, yes. we see mm -hmm. mainly dipole. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the periodic emission has only L of uh, two. Yes. We do see the two poles, sometimes mm -hmm. we see four. Okay, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Clearly along a, uh, so there is a torque from the magnetosphere onto the surface. That's right, yeah. And the longer the period, the smaller the area this torque is applied. I mean, to me, that was sort of the uh, obvious way to like, associate the two. All right, yeah. Uh, so they, 
the longer the period, the smaller the polar cap, if you like. And that's, for, of course, for dipole, yeah. but it's not quite dipole. Yeah. But they're still polar caps, and they get, yeah. they are related. They know about the, uh, the uh, light cylinder. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, the longer the period, the larger the light cylinder, the smaller the polar cap to some extent. That's, Does that make okay. sense to you? Yes, yes, it makes sense. Actually, we have um, we have looked into that uh, problem with uh, Vasilis Karagiorgopoulos and uh, Yanis Kondopoulos. Uh, and actually, we tried to calculate the, um, the return current because this is what is spinning down the pulsar and how it's going to couple to the crust. What we found is that these currents uh, do not penetrate very deeply into the crust. And um, we calculated the energy, if you want, that uh, the magnetic field will have in this region. And uh, this is not uh, sufficient for, um, for, the, for the flares. So the flares mm, probably are more manifest of uh, internal magnetic field twisting um, rather than something that is uh, imposed from the exterior. So the internal field, this has to do with some, with the thermal energy in the crust. Is that what basically moves the field around to cause the flare? So, so the, the internal field, exactly. The, the internal field uh, um, is, um, is having some electric currents and um, these uh, uh, electric currents are carried by electrons. So essentially these electrons are moving around uh, the field lines if you want, in the crust and they are twisting it. And this can go on for um, uh, tens of kilo years actually. Okay, well, I... Yeah, so that's, I don't that, understand that's the all essence I of the whole well, effect. I, I will not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will not ask any more questions. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's the idea of the whole effect, essentially. Um, yes, I would like to understand yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> so sure. There, is the, okay. there are currents, in short, short scale currents, basically, and that, and, and that moves the field out? No, no, the, the, it, it, it twists the field inside the crust. And then this affects the, the, the field near the surface. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to ask something? Not from what I see, neither from the audience. Then, Constantine, thank you again. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. And uh, for the rest of you, you will be informed about our next uh, seminar uh, next week. Okay, so, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very bye. much.